Hello and welcome to week 5 of this course on international human rights law in Kashmir prospects and challenges. This week we will discuss the right to liberty and security of person protection against arbitrary detention with our expert speaker Dr. Priya Pillai. Priya is an international lawyer with two decades of legal experience and her work focuses on international justice and accountability. Priya has previously worked in various national and international institutions including the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia ICTY and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies IFRC headquarters in Geneva. She holds a PhD in international law from the Graduate Institute Geneva and is a contributing editor at the international law blog of Geneva Juris. We are truly delighted to have you today with us Priya. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much Samir uh just a big thank you to you for organizing this you know series of discussions and and lectures and really it's a pleasure and honor to be here with all of you i suspect to be honest i have a lot more to learn from y'all than vice versa but i will do my best i think i've you know i've been brought in for a very specific area of law and a very specific topic so you know i i hope i do it justice um to be honest i think a little bit of a caveat is that there's really a lot to pack in and there's you know we have a discrete amount of time so what i would just say at the beginning is my aim this you know today is really to give you all an overview as broad a picture as possible just to give you a sense of what is out there what is the universe of international human human rights law what are the issues that come up i'm sure you know a lot of these issues of course come up within the context of domestic law as well so just to give you a bit of a sense of of sort of the the approach that i've taken for this this session and i think with that let me do the screen share and i hope you know technologically i i i sort of don't mess up too badly but let's just try this right now just to confirm is that is that working okay fantastic okay so you know we've got a lot to cover so i guess i should just jump right into things um as you know i've been asked to focus on international human rights law relating to one very specific aspect and a very specific topic the right to liberty and security and i think let's you know let's go through a few of the fundamentals to start with really and again i i i'm sure that many of you already know this but for those who are not that familiar i think it's good for us to just get a little bit of a grounding but also before that i'll just let you know um sort of the the structure of of my discussion or my presentation for for this session essentially a little bit on fundamentals so that we just know where we look at this right where we are in the context of international human rights law i will then pick specifically on one article obviously of the international covenant of civil and political rights which really delves into some of the details and while i'm not going to refer to a lot of the case law what i will do is refer to some of the fundamental principles that have come across by virtue of case law including in regional courts but also at the uh, human rights committee as well as some of the other sort of mechanisms i will then and and this is where i think you know international law the big question always is of course enforcement one is on the norms and you know how the law develops but the other question links is related to what is the way that some of these uh, violations can be addressed and i would like to focus very specifically on one of the bodies that works specifically on this issue and that comes out with decisions on you know aspects of law and that essentially helps in the development of the law as well so this is the working group on arbitrary detention so we'll go into a little bit of detail because i do think it's important to also understand the mechanisms and understand the minutia of how some of these mechanisms work so that they can then be you know used or that they can then be approached in certain cases so i think we need to know beyond the theory and beyond the norm norms that are in existence and the development of the law how it actually gets implemented as well so we look at that and then we will also look a little bit at the guiding principles that have recently been developed you know about 5 years ago and where that stands in the context of international law so that's just broadly the structure 
I think in, in terms of fundamentals, really at its very basic, what is the significance of this right? Why are we concerned? Why are we talking about you know, the, the question of arbitrary detention? And at its root, at its core really, is the point that you are looking at a way of balancing the overwhelming power of the state. You're looking at a way that you protect individuals and that you provide a certain uh, form of legal protection that would enable, you know, either to ensure that the state does not overstep boundaries or that there is a way of, um, you know, mitigating some of the impact of these violations as well. So I think at its really fundamental, that is sort of the core essence of this, right? And while it's also a standalone, I think it's important to also realize that this right is linked in many situations to different rights. It's also linked to the expression of other rights, such as you know freedom of expression, freedom of association. That's when sometimes the violations of arbitrary arrest and detention actually do occur linked to these other rights. But that's not to say it's not a standalone right on its own. And it has a tremendous amount of significance and importance in the fabric of international human rights law as a means of protection and as a way of safeguarding individual interests. I think in terms of locating the right, you know, um, we look at international law through the lens of treaty law, customary law, general principles of law. If you really look at the statute of the ICJ, you look at Article 38, where does international law really come from? And I think it's important for us to undertake the exercise of understanding where some of these protections emanate from and you know, what work has been done and how the, this right has evolved and developed over time as well. And, and I think you'll, you'll understand you know, why I, I think this is an important point, especially when we come further down the line, when I'm talking about the working group on arbitrary detention, as well as the UN guiding principle. So just keep this in mind. This is one of those initial um, you know, ideas that you need to keep in mind, which will then influence how you approach the law and how you approach the means of um, implementation as well as enforcement. So keep that in mind. We're looking at treaty law, but we're also looking at customary law, which consists of the practice of states and what states feel is valid and lawful as well. So, you know, sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect between public international law and international human rights law. But I think there are actually many areas that we need to investigate and we actually need to um, delve into a little bit more. So keep this in mind as we move forward. Of course, this right is also, also implicates a number of different areas of law. So, you know, the, the focus today will be international human rights law, but there are also provisions within the context of humanitarian law, within the context of refugee law that also concern this right. So again, just to, just to sort of let you know that there's that broader palette and there's a, a broader picture out there as well. Today we'll focus on something quite specific, but for you to know that there are other areas and sources of law that must be looked at as well to get a holistic picture. As I'd mentioned, you know, linked to treaty law, one of the uh, older cases at the International Court of Justice, which was the uh, case regarding the US diplomatic and consular staff in Iran, actually talked about what it meant to detain arbitrarily and what this confinement meant. It was a dicta of the court, but again, something that I think gives you an indication within the context of public international law as well, which is more a state realm, that this is a right that has been discussed and that this is something of significance and consequence that we need to take seriously. Of course, you all will all have you know, looked at the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, UDHR, Article 9 is very clear. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest, det detention, or exile. So that's you know, a, a very clear statement within the UDHR. ICCPR Article 9 is much more expansive. We've got five um, paragraphs, five sub-provisions within Article 9, which we will go into more detail. We'll, you know, we'll literally go paragraph by paragraph so that you get a better sense of what are the, the what are the processes that are implicated when we're talking about this right as well? 
And then, of course, you've got other treaties as well. So, for instance, you've got, you know, a reference to vulnerable categories. You've got a convention on the rights of the child. What are the limits of detention, arbitrary detention as well, with regard to vulnerable uh, categories such as children, migrants, refugees? What are some of these provisions? Do they apply to everybody? Do they only apply to certain people? Is the scope different as well? And I think those are some of the fundamental issues that we also need to look at in terms of how we, um, how we assess you know, the details of these rights and how it is also implemented and how it's enforced. And as I mentioned before, of course, you've got this link between IHL, humanitarian law and human rights law. There's been a lot of work done on the complementary nature of these two sort of uh, bodies of law. And I think, again, this is something that we need to keep in mind and keep, you know, keep, ensure that we understand that it's not one or the other, but that these bodies of law are also complementary. So they, they are mutually reinforcing. And I think that's something that we, we need to keep in mind as well. I think what I'll do is just very briefly right now on the fundamentals, what does Article 9 really talk about? What are the basics really that come within the purview of Article 9 of the ICCPR? One is, of course, the very obvious, the, the, the right that is stated up front. Everybody has the right to liberty and security of, of the person. So what does this mean? Does it mean that we're essentially saying you cannot charge or you cannot um, imprison anyone? I mean, clearly that's not the case. So really, what, what do we mean when we say right to liberty? Is it completely unfettered? If it's not, what are the limitations? What are... What is the, the scope? What is reasonable to consider within the, the purview of protection for this right? Um, clearly, we're talking about arbitrary arrest or detention. What does that mean? Is there some way that we can understand the concept of arbitrariness? And how does, the, how does this link to you know, various processes, whether it's criminal justice processes, whether it's administrative processes, whether it's juvenile justice? There are, again, multiple areas that this, you know, the, the scope of this um, can cover. So again, we'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail on that. Deprivation of liberty in accordance with law. What does this mean? If you've got a bad law on the books, does it mean that if you deprive someone of liberty just because it's in accordance with this law, then that it's fine? That's again, something that we need to inquire into because, you know, by that logic, essentially you could have a slew of really terrible laws and you could justify the deprivation of liberty based on the fact that, well, we've got a law on the law books and that is, you know, that is enough justification. It's not, but we'll understand why and how we need to sort of build that argument or how we need to look at this, uh, the concept of deprivation of liberty in relation to law. Of course, I mean, at its basic, Article 9 really talks about habeas corpus, the writ of habeas corpus, which, you know, all of us in domestic jurisdictions, mostly common law jurisdictions, are well-versed and familiar with. Of course, there are equivalent uh, writs in, in, you know, continental and civil law systems as well. So essentially, to ensure that you have protection and that the person is brought before judicial authorities and that there is that level of, um, you know, legal review and assurance that somebody is being held legitimately and that the person, the individual is being cared for and is, you know, is not being uh, abused in detention as well. So again, that's something that is a, is a core part of this, right? And of course, conditions of detention. So whether if there's a detention that to start with seems legal, whether conditions of detention would result in that being illegal or violative of this article. Again, something that we need to look at, which is probably a step further, which looks at sort of some of the procedural aspects, but also substantively, what is the, you know, the way in which an individual is being held. So I think that's something that we need to uh, look at in more detail. And then of course, remedies. So what do we do? What, do, what happens when there is a violation of this right, of Article 9? Does Article 9 provide for certain remedies or provide for an approach that states need to undertake when this right is violated. And we look at some of the details as well linked to remedies, because I think 
you know, that's again really important. You, you, when you have a right, you need to have a remedy for the violation of that remedy. And this holds true in domestic law, this holds true in, in international law, international human rights law as well. So I think those are sort of just some of the fundamentals. Um, what I'll do now is just go into a little bit of detail just to let you know what is out there. And I'm not going to pick up on you know, these regional treaties and go into them in a lot of detail, but just to let you know that besides the ICCPR, we've also got regional um, treaties and regional mechanisms that can provide redress or that will address violations of, these, uh, of this right. For example, you know, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, clearly Article 6 refers to arbitrary detention. You've got guidelines. So I think I've referred to you know, also what has been done within the, the context of these regional systems. So you've got the evolution of the development of the law in the form of guidelines, in the form of principles, in the form of soft law instruments, which you know, have a slightly different status, but they all gear towards the development and the evolution of this right. And I think it's important to remember, of course, that in the Asian context, we do not have a regional sort of mechanism. We do not have a regional treaty. So that's one area where we've, you know, we don't have the evolution of that jurisprudence, but we can look to the African uh, system. We can look to the Americas, the Inter-American Court, as well as the Commission. We can look to well, ASEAN possibly not so much right now, to be honest, but you know, the European Convention on Human Rights as well. So I think just to emphasize the point that this is a right that has also been embodied in regional treaties across the board. And that as a result of these regional mechanisms, treaty mechanisms, you've got the evolution and development of the right and a lot of jurisprudence. So you know, if you go to the European Court of Human Rights website, you will see a, a huge body of case law linked to arbitrary detention, linked to Article 5. The African Charter, you will again see a body of jurisprudence and case law. And I think it's important to also understand that the process by which, you know, a lot of these uh, cases or communications come to these regional bodies with different fact scenarios, different fact patterns, all help in enumerating the, the right in more detail and help sort of giving it uh, a lot more clarity. So there are areas that are still you know, being discussed, that are still being developed. And it's important to know that these regional treaties and instruments exist and that there's a strong body of jurisprudence within each of these silos and that there's also cross fertilization so that you know, the Inter-American Court looks at the European Court as well and says, well, okay, in this case, you know, this was decided was the rationale something that we can apply as well. So there is that inter interaction as well. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. So this, you know, I'm, I'm very briefly skimming over just for y'all to know that there's a, a, a lot of jurisprudence and there's a lot of discussion of the right in all these systems as well. But let's come back. I think for me, the focus this evening really is on the ICCPR and is on really finding out some of the details and the nitty gritty of what goes into Article 9. And I think it's also important, especially in terms of the next session that you all will have on Saturday, which is you're looking at the direct applicability of this right in the context of Kashmir as well. So I think it's important to understand ICCPR in more detail, especially given the context and the circumstances. So I'll just read out, you know, Article 9.1. And, and I don't know if you have uh, the article in front of you, but just to give you a sense of what it says. It says, everybody has the right to liberty and security of person. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest or detention. No one shall be deprived of liberty except on such grounds and in accordance with such procedure as established by law. So we've got a number of, of sort of uh, points that we need to pull out from this, this very first paragraph of Article 9. The right to liberty and security, who does it apply to? Essentially, it's guaranteed to all, all categories of people, you know, men, women, LGBT, children, vulnerable categories. You've got, essentially, this is, this will not exclude anybody. It's meant to be all-encompassing. 
and I think just to also emphasize the point, and I know that this was part of the, the reference material that was sent to you as well, the, um, the Human Rights Committee, basically, which is the, the committee that you know, develops the law or discusses the law linked to the ICCPR, has issued what is called a general comment. And general comment number 35 is specific to Article 9. So I would really urge you to look at that. I've drawn a lot you know, for today from there as well. Again, keeping the focus on the ICCPR and then also on the working group. But just to let you know that that's a, a very valuable source because that really delves into the details of what each of these articles mean. Um, liberty, as I said, you know, is it absolute? No, clearly not. You have situations where you have the criminal law that applies, you have administrative law, but it cannot be arbitrary. And I think the, the question of what is arbitrary is critical in this juncture. That is sort of the key component in a way. And there's, a, and I've, I've referred to a communication with, at, at the Human Rights Committee, which basically says arbitrariness is when it's inappropriate, it's unjust, it's unpredictable, there's no due process of law. So it's a number of, um, number of points that come out of this notion of arbitrariness and what it means and what it means to violate the, the right you know, on, on arbitrary detention as well. What it also means is if you have detention, you need a periodic review of detention. You need a detention that is uh, assessed at regular intervals and it can't just be, you know, you detain somebody and then you don't check in or there's no review of this detention for months on end. That's something that would be violative of Article, uh, Article 9. As I mentioned before, the conditions of detention, these can constitute arbitrariness as well. So even if a detention to start with may have been legal, as the conditions of detention are, are sort of understood to be you know, terrible conditions or conditions where somebody is held incommunicado, someone's held in solitary confinement, even something that may have been legal to start with becomes illegal. So again, important to understand that we're looking at the start, but we're looking also at the evolution of how this detention is, is, um, is handled as well. Enforced disappearances, essentially aggravated arbitrary detention where you, know, you have people who have been disappeared, you don't know where they are, you don't know whether they are under judicial review, you basically have no access that also would fall foul of um, Article 9.1. And as I mentioned, you know, it's not just criminal law and it's not just criminal detention, it's security detention, it's immigration detention, administrative detention. There are all these different regimes within the national law itself. And these would all be covered by Article 9.1. You know, so it's not focused only on criminal law and criminal procedure. Um, Article 9.2 of the ICCPR basically says anyone who is arrested shall be informed at the time of arrest of the reasons for his arrest and promptly informed of charges against him. So again, a few things from this one sentence that you can pull out. Reason for arrest and provision of information. It's not enough to arrest somebody on a whim. Of course, that happens. We all know that that happens. But the requirement is that there must be reasons information needs to be provided to the person, the charges on the basis of which somebody is arrested or detained need to be made clear and need to be articulated. And this includes the legal basis, but also the factual basis. It can't be one or the other. I mean, it has to be in the entirety. What is the person being accused of? What are the charges? What is the information that um, is available to the detain detaining authority to go ahead and, and you know, uh, make this detention or arrest. And of course, linked to it is also the fact that there needs to be an ability to seek release. So you cannot have a detention where you don't have the ability to ask for release, that you don't have an option or a, or a way to ensure that you could be released, especially if the information is you know, insufficient, the charges are not appropriate, the factual basis is not there. Therefore, it's essentially a, a relief or a way of ensuring that this detention is, um, is held, held to be violative. In terms of the information, so does it mean that you can give information three weeks later, four weeks later, you know, X amount of time? No, it needs to be immediate as well. And again, the concept of immediacy is something that has been 
looked at by the Human Rights Committee in some detail, also the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, invariably, you know, beyond 48 hours is seen as excessive and not uh, in keeping with the requirements of Article 9. And, and again, that is sort of at the outer ends. So I think, again, ne you need to understand sort of how the committee has interpreted this article and what it means. And I think each of these sentences, each of these provisions have, you know, a particular uh, meaning and particular substance that gives the right um, sort of more, more force and, and you know, um, more gravity as well. Again, keep in mind that this includes all regimes. This includes military prosecutions, it includes special re regimes, including terrorism legislation. So again, it's all encompassing. There's no carve out or opt out option, so to speak, from Article 92 as well. Article 93 is a bit more substantial. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a three, two sentence, well, it's quite a large paragraph. I won't read the whole thing, but again, just to paraphrase a little bit, essentially anyone arrested or detained on a criminal charge must be brought promptly before a judge or another officer authorized by the law to exercise judicial power. And I think that's the key as well. And shall be entitled to trial within a reasonable time or release. And it shall not be the general rule that persons awaiting trial shall be detained in custody, but release may be subject to guarantees. So I think, you know, we all know about fair trial rights, and we all know about what needs to happen in the course of the trial. This is just one step before. This basically says if you have been arrested or detained, fundamentally there must be judicial oversight of this detention. And I think that's critical. All cases, no exception. And critically, this is not linked to the assertion of the right by the detainee. So it's not based on whether I, as a detainee, say that I want judicial oversight or you know, um, say that this is a right that is owed to me. Regardless of whether, for instance, if I'm incommunicado, if I'm in solitary confinement, if there's no way that you can even ask for this right, you shouldn't have to. That's the point. The point is that it, it emanates from 9.3 and it's not linked to somebody asking for this review. That automatically there should be judicial review. And again, the promptness of this, not more than 48 hours. Again, these are some things that you know, have been developed by jurisprudence, by the committee, as well as by the working group. So we need to keep that in mind as well in terms of what are the limits of when this judicial oversight can happen. What is 9.3 essentially? 9.3 is essentially a safeguard. It's a safeguard against torture. It's a safeguard that ensures the physical appearance of the person who has been arrested or detained. It also is linked to legal assistance that the person is entitled and must have legal assistance in the articulation of these claims, in, in the process that is being undergone by the person as well, linked to you know, the charges or the, the arrest process. So again, critical that legal assistance is provided for and that there is the ability, of course, if you're saying legal assistance, what does that mean? I mean, you, you can't be in communicado, you can't not be able to communicate with your lawyer, you need to have that access as well. So these are all inherent in this right. And they're also, of course, as I've mentioned, have been discussed in more detail um, by the committee, by the regional courts, and you know, other mechanisms as well. In terms of pretrial detention, one of the points that the general comment made is that there, if there are delays, there need to be clear, coherent reasons for these delays. And again, the delay can't be excessive. The delay can't be, you know, where you have people languishing for ages, which again, as we know, happens and clearly would be violative of Article 3. The other point that I would make is um, where you're talking about public security, where people have been held in pretrial detention based on the vague articulation of there's a public security threat or this person needs to be detained because of public security issues. And the committee is very clear. It basically says, look, public security, this is vague. This is not something that would meet the requirements of 9.3. And you really cannot detain somebody indefinitely in this way on the basis of this vague assertion Then it needs to be much more concrete and it needs to be much more uh, clear in terms of law and fact. So 
again, something to keep in mind, again, we all know that public security is something that is used um, quite a lot in these cases and that, you know, there, ha there has been a, a detailed discussion on this, on this point specifically as well. 9.4, 9.4 is basically essentially uh, one of the more, I would say one of the most important provisions within Article 9 as well. And, and I think, you know, it, it's something that I will read out as well, which says anyone who is deprived of his liberty by arrest or detention shall be entitled to take proceedings before a court in order that the court may decide without delay on the lawfulness of his detention and order his release if the detention is not lawful. Again, it's this one sentence that actually packs in quite a lot into, into this one provision. Essentially, what does this provision say? Essentially, it's saying, there must be a remedy. There must be a way that this detention is, you know, uh, is remedied basically. And that the means to do that is by proceedings before a court. And that must be the recourse that is available under this right. Again, the embodiment of habeas corpus and to ensure that the person has an ability and can assert that, you know, the detention either is illegal or it's um, arbitrary and that this needs to be reviewed essentially. And again, to clarify, this is not linked again to just a criminal process. It is linked to those who might be held in house arrest. It's linked to those who might be held in solitary confinement, in communal cardo detention, you know, administrative processes, not just the criminal justice process. So any means or form in which somebody is detained that person needs to have the ability to challenge this and to challenge this in a court. And so what does that mean? I mean, challenge it in a court, but then what happens? Essentially, what's the objective of this provision? The objective is really that it's the right to be released for the court to find that, okay, you've been detained. This is arbitrary. We find there are sufficient uh, criteria for arbitrariness and therefore we will release you. So. I think that's sort of the key, that's the underlying reason for this provision as well. And I think obviously the corollary to that would be that the reviewing court needs to have the power or the ability to release and that there needs to be compliance with this order. So for example, you know, uh, one of the communications that I've uh, cited in this, in this context is a communication that arose in Australia, A versus Australia. And this is a case where it was a Cambodian detainee who was in refugee detention. So basically seeking asylum, was held in detention for a, you know, an inordinate amount of time. And basically um, petitioned the Human Rights Committee to say, the court that I can approach or the administrative proceedings or the, the approach within this law, the law may be may provide a certain recourse, but it doesn't meet the criteria or meet the standards of Article 9. Basically, it's not um, a court that has the power to release me, and it's not a court in the, in the sense of Article 9 where you know, the order will be complied with. It's still within the refugee and, and asylum process, and it doesn't have the relevant powers that are required by Article 9. And the committee held you know, upheld um, A, of course a pseudonym, upheld A's um, communication and basically adopted this and said, yes, you have a local legislation that has these certain provisions, which in the context of that seems okay, but in the context of the ability to release the person or challenge or comply with the order, it doesn't fill the criteria. So again, it, it essentially necessitates that we're looking at really subjectively what are the powers of these courts. It's, it's not sufficient to say there's a particular court that will oversee it. Well, if it does, can the court release the person? Will the court's orders be complied with? So I think that's the next level of granularity that we need to look at. It's not just sufficient to say on, the, on, on paper, this court is sufficient because you know it's judicial review at, at, at its bare minimum. That's not um, sufficient and that will not meet the criteria of Article 9.4. And as, as I said before, 
And this is something that, you know, that that court in its review might be able to also say, which is a detention which was lawful at the start can become unlawful, depending on the circumstances of, de of detention, the conditions of detention, the manner in which the person is detained, etc. So there are a number of criteria that the court in itself can and should be able to look at in order to um, meet and satisfy the criteria within Article 9. And, you know, as I say, lawfulness of detention, it's linked to violation of domestic law, but it's also linked to the violation of the ICCPR. So you need to put both together, such as, for example, in the, the case of A versus Australia, where you look, where the committee looked at the law within the domestic context, as well as looked at what it would mean within the context of Article 9, and then determined how um, and whether the detention was lawful or not. So again, something to keep in mind in terms of how um, these cases are assessed and, and you know, adjudicated. In terms of the basic idea of, well, if it's review, what does that mean? It's a court, it's a judicial authority, it's a specialized tribunal, anybody that has the powers of a judicial authority and that can review detention and release. So again, even if it's not called specifically a court, even if it's called a tribunal or whether it's called, called something else, I think it's the essence of what that institution is and what it can do that is relevant to how we assess compliance with Article 9.4. And of course, you know, I, I mean, this is sort of a, a part of all adjudication ideally, which is that it needs to be expeditious. So for example, if you have a, um, a person who has approached a court on you know on grounds that he or she has been arbitrary or they have been arbitrarily detained the court needs to also be able to and make that decision um in an expeditious manner so not just have the power to do it but also actually do it in an expeditious manner so again it's also the theory but it's also the practical you know how does this court approach and how does the court actually function and work which will link back to 9.4 and whether it's a violation of Article 9.4 or not. So I think, you know, with that, we come to sort of the last sub provision of Article 9, which is 9.5. Anyone who has been the victim of unlawful arrest or detention shall have an enforceable right to compensation. Now, this is a problem, you know, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why subsequently, but within the context of 9.5, essentially, what is it saying? It's saying, We've got these four provisions which detail in what manner your detention might be arbitrary and illegal. And so what next? There must be a right to an effective remedy. And for, you know, 9.4 talks about the remedy of release. 9.5 talks about the remedy of an enforceable right of compensation, not just a right of compensation that is, again, on a piece of paper, but that is something that can be enforced and that can be, uh, that is, um, that does actually happen in practice. So again, it's, it's linked to the fact that, you know, you can release somebody, compensate them. The legal framework needs to be there. So states need to show that that legal framework is in place, but also that they actually do provide compensation. It's not just, you know, uh, uh, on, in theory or, or on a piece of paper. It can be at the initiative of the victim as well. And this is an important point. So 9.5 talks about compensation for the harm of arbitrary detention. There are other violations that may also be compensated. So for example, linked to freedom of association, freedom of expression, if there've been violations of those rights as well under, under the ICCPR. Yes, of course, those are rights that you, know, you can seek compensation for, but 9.5 is talking specifically about compensation for the harm that has been caused by arbitrary detention. Mental harm, physical harm, you know, there are other ways of computing it, but essentially this is uh, the requirement that is linked to arbitrary detention itself and not, not necessarily all the other rights as well. So very specific. With that, sort of that is just an, an overview of the ICCPR and, and Article 9. But it's important to realize that there are other rights also under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. 
essentially at its basic in many cases arbitrary detention is used to suppress other rights of course this is you know i don't need to say it but when you're looking at freedom of expression freedom of association other rights that are provided for and guaranteed within the iccpr that are then um curtailed by means of violating article 9 and the right you know the right against arbitrary detention at its basic the right to life article 6 which is you know sacrosanct as well within the iccpr article 7 talks about torture and ill treatment again prohibited you have a separate convention against torture as well which again does you know link to detention conditions of detention arbitrary detention as well iccpr within the context of of the uh, treaty also has article 10 which talks about conditions of detention um you've got article 24 which deals with rights accorded to children including in juvenile detention as well so you've got a lot of of other rights as well within the context of um within the context of the iccpr also good to remember that many of these rights of course are reflected in other treaties as well you know as i mentioned the the prohibition of torture uh the convention on the rights of the child so you've got these sort of nine main treaties which also link and and you know i haven't had the time and you know we don't have the time today to go into all of those as well but for you to know that there is that connection and that link as well and to keep in mind that some of the other treaty bodies also have general comments or you know modes of interpretation where they have picked up on specific aspects within the context of their treaty so within the context of the convention on the rights of the child what detention might mean within the context of cedo the rights of women what detention might mean so we've got all those um areas to look at also and areas that are, are rich in case law and and jurisprudence the one point that i think is really important as well and and i'm sure you all will go into it in more detail is article 4 So article 4 of the ICCPR talks about states of emergency. What impact or what is the implication of article 4 states of emergency to article 9? Does it mean that article 9 can be violated? Does it mean, you know, what what exactly is that link as well? As you know, and again the uh, general comment make th- makes this quite clear so does the working group on arbitrary detention article 9 keeping in mind this idea of ihl and ihrl being complementary as well so human rights law humanitarian law complement each other as well article 9 is applicable in conflict where ihl also applies so i think that's one of the first things to keep in mind and to remember article 4 talks about clearly states of emergency what happens and what are the rights within the iccpr that can be derogated from so basically that can be curtailed in a way or that can be taken away from within the context of the iccpr and article 4 has a list of non derogable rights so a right that you cannot regardless of a state of emergency say you know what we're not going to comply with this that's not an option so the right to life it's a non derogable right regardless of whether there's an emergency or not with regardless of whether a state invokes the state of emergency or not article 9 is not included in that list under article 4 however looking at you know keep in mind the interpretation on the in the general comment as well as by the working group on, on arbitrary detention there there are limits to the power of this derogation and that this cannot be in excess of the exigency of the situation so again there are checks and balances again it's not carte blanche it's basically you know not saying that you can essentially not comply with article 9 in any way and that's fine in the context of a state of emergency it's not and the interpretation is quite clear in the general comment as well so you know i think that's something that's important to keep in mind the working group on arbitrary detention has uh you know come out with these guiding principles as well and essentially it says that it's absolutely non derogable to challenge the lawfulness of this detention in an armed conflict in a state of emergency and and i think that was again one of the the uh, references that i had sent across which is you know the the report that the wag did in 2014 which which was the basis for the un basic principles as well which really focuses on what are the international laws what are the national laws 
on this specific aspect and basically has come out with its legal analysis saying it's non-derogable. So again, that's something that I would really urge you to read. And I think it's, it's a very accessible report and it's a very clear report in how it approaches the legal issues linked to this. And again, you know, this state of emergency and the way that you might uh, modify the approach to Article 9 is again relevant to the criteria of arbitrariness. So if you're saying there's a state of emergency, but you essentially are, you know, violating Article 9 completely or really not ensuring compliance at all, clearly that's an arbitrary approach and that would be considered arbitrary detention. So again, I think this is a, this is a point that's important. Um, the, uh, the Human Rights Committee also has a general comment on states of emergency specifically. I think it's a 2000 or 2001 comment. And I would urge you to also take a look at that comment uh, in a bit more detail. Okay, so why I had mentioned um, specifically the right of compensation. When you're looking at ICCPR and you know, you've know you got the question of reservations and whether you can reserve or you can basically say, carve out a few exceptions from international treaties. India has a declaration on the ICCPR and it basically says in, in its entirety on article nine, essentially it's going to be in consonance with provisions of the constitution, article 22 of the constitution. So essentially if there's any um, conflict or if there's any incompatibility, the declaration basically reverts back to the constitution and, and article 22. And more specifically on the enforceable right of compensation, it clearly carves that out and says that within the legal system, there is no enforceable right. And therefore, you know, essentially we don't agree with this. So that's definitely problematic and something that we need to keep into, take into account when we assess how the ICCPR is, um, is implemented by the state. So any, any state that you're looking at, you need to take a look at the reservations and the declarations linked to the particular treaty to see what has been said at the, um, at the outset and whether there are exceptions that have been carved out. Keep in mind that the um, general comment as well as the working group also talk about the fact that you, know, you can, cannot have such extensive reservations that would be incompatible with the spirit of the treaty. So again, that's something that you, know, you need to keep in mind when we're, when we're looking at, at the, the details of, of how some of these are implemented. Okay, so in terms of remedies, um, we've got the ICCPR optional protocol, which basically ensures that you can give individual complaints to the Human Rights Committee. So that's you know some of the references that I've made. There's a huge body now of law that has developed from these individual complaints. And again, these are all available. Of course, many of them are you know have pseudonyms or anonymized, but these are all available again on on in the annual report and, and on, the, um, on the website. You've got regional treaty mechanisms, and then you've got this slightly different group called the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. And I think it's quite interesting to see what it actually is, what it does, and what it means for the development of law and you know, for the development of this specific area of law within the context of IHRL. So let's look at that in a little bit of detail. Okay, so the working group on arbitrary detention was essentially, you know, the old Commission on Human Rights, which is which no longer exists anymore, was basically uh, the WAG, WGAD was basically established under the auspices of the Commission of Human Rights. And it's now basically under the Human Rights Council. Its mandate has been extended for another three years from 2019. It's interesting to note that it's not a treaty body. It basically draws its mandate and its reference from the UN Charter. So for example, the, con the Convention on the Rights of the Child, there's a Committee on the Rights of the Child. So that's one of the treaty bodies. It's linked to that treaty. Here, you don't have a separate treaty on arbitrary detentions. You've got you know, provisions in multiple treaties. And now you have this one body, which is a UN mandate. It is a charter body. It's not a treaty body, which looks at complaints, which analyzes these complaints, which basically assesses how and in what manner 
um, Article 9 has been complied with or violated and, you know, basically um, investigates and makes these decisions based on these, on these complaints. And again, it's, it's got the mandate to do this. And the mandate was affirmed in 1997 and it continues to work on this mandate. So I think it's an important um, institution to look at from multiple levels. One, in terms of what impact it's actually having and two, in terms of sort of the broader idea of the evolution of the law as well. Um, so as I said, you know, essentially it's to investigate cases of deprivation of liberty imposed arbitrarily. It seeks and receives information from states, from NGOs, from individuals, from a wide variety of sources, basically. It can act on the information it receives. So there's a procedure called the urgent appeals procedure. And, and we'll go into a little bit of detail on that. It is also entitled, well, it has the mandate to undertake country visits. Of course, that depends also on um, the state, you know, um, allowing those visits as well. So of course, that is where, again, it becomes problematic in terms of enforcement and implementation. A little bit of detail on how it works, like how does it do some of this stuff and, and what's the manner? So it's, it's, and you will find this document also on the website. So the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, you know, as part of the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights, has its own website, has its own links. There's a document from 2017, which talks about the working methods of the group. It meets three times a year. It can issue or adopt opinions on individual communications, which are included in the annual report that go to the Human Rights Council. It can also, I guess, as a way of, of, of uh, sort of checking itself, it can review its own opinions as well. There's what is called the urgent action procedure. So in case there is a critical case where somebody has been detained, there's a fear for their life, there's you know, a, a lot of circumstances which, where you know that there's a, a danger to the life and liberty of this person, the working group on arbitrary detention can essentially hurry up its process and procedure and you know reach out to a government reach out directly and say look we are concerned about this person we need to know that this person is okay it's called an urgent action procedure the working group basically says look by doing this doesn't mean we've already prejudged the communication of the case but we understand that this is one way of ensuring safety and ensuring security of of you know of the person so this is one of the methods or the processes that it uses it coordinates with other treaty bodies. As I said, you know, this is a right that has, that you find in multiple other treaties as well. And so it would make sense for the working group, and which is what it does, to coordinate with other treaty bodies. For example, the uh, Committee uh, on the Prohibition Against Torture. If there's somebody of common interest or somebody that is, you know, within the scope or purview of that treaty and they want to make a, a statement or a decision, Again, the working group on arbitrary detention will coordinate with these treaty bodies again. And it also does what are what issues what are called deliberations, which are essentially in the form of principles, preventive, not linked to an active case, you know, or not linked to an actual individual at that moment that, that needs help or needs assistance. Um, I would suggest, you know, take a look at the working group on arbitrary detention, the website, and they've got all their reports thematically in the last few years. So on multiple areas, including, you know, migration, including vulnerable populations, and thematically what the working group has articulated linked to arbitrary detention and the issues that come up. So again, a, a valuable source of information and, and really, a, I would really urge you to take a look at that. This is actually quite interesting. And I think this is a, a sense of how you implement some of the principles of Article 9 in, a, in an assessment of arbitrary detention and whether it's a violation of Article 9 as well. So the working group has uh, categorizes in five ways whether a detention is arbitrary or not. And it, it ranks them from category one to category five. Category one is basically Essentially, it's impossible to invoke any legal basis to justify the deprivation. That's a category one violation. And you know, just to let you know that when the group working group assesses and comes out with its opinions, it goes through very clearly the facts, the circumstances, 
and then we'll actually apply law and fact and say we think on this particular case this is a category 1 violation of arbitrary detention for the this and this reason category 2 deprivation re results from the exercise of rights or freedoms under the udhr iccpr as i mentioned at the beginning arbitrary detention is a way to curtail the exercise of other rights freedom of expression freedom of association so category 2 deprivation is essentially where you know that that detention is linked to somebody speaking out linked to association you know linked to these other rights as well category 3 is a total or partial non observance of norms you know which is of such a gravity that it results in an arbitrary character for the detention as well category 4 which is not that uh, uh, relevant here is linked to asylum seekers immigrants refugees as i mentioned you know many of them are held in administrative detention procedures and as we've seen from from the news in the last few years some are held for months and years as well without access without the ability to even be released or to get out so again that's that's catered for and and speci specified within uh, within this um, within the categories of the working group and the last one is discrimination where essentially you have um deprived somebody of liberty on the basis of this uh, discriminatory intent or a discriminatory manner and that is also included in a in a sort of separate assessment and quite clearly you know keep in mind that many of these you could have a category 1 2 and 4 detention together you could be violating multiple uh, multiple um parts of article 9 as well in terms of the sessions and the opinions that have been adopted so the last session of the working group was november 2020 they adopted 32 opinions including in relation to australia china uae saudi arabia and india and of course the most um sort of i, I think um, discussed case of course is the case of safura zargar who you know the the decision came out on the 11th of march just a few days ago where the working group has found a violation of three categories within the context of article 9 so i would really urge that you take a look at the uh, report of the working group and it's got all these 32 opinions you know separately on the website as well and i think when you get when you read the the opinion you get a sense of the approach that has been taken by the working group in how they analyze and how they assess the law and how they assess article 9 so again it gives you clarity on article 9 and the approach taken on article 9 i know i'm i'm coming to the end of time so i'll just very quickly um just tell you about the un basic principles and guidelines and i think these are really important as well um basic principles and guidelines linked to the right of anybody deprived to bring proceedings before a court now in 2014 the working group basically through its mandate um came up with a study looking at international law so all the regional uh, provisions looking at national law. they sent out a, a sort of questionnaire to i think multiple states to all states and got back responses from 44 states basically mapping what are the national provisions on arbitrary detention and on the access to proceedings before a court specifically on that point and basically they found out that not just in the context of international law and the regional mechanisms but looking at domestic law that this is something that is in every domestic system and every every jurisdiction essentially that has responded to them so the working group has done you know has gone one step further than the human rights committee in its assessment on uh, in its general comment the working group has basically said look we've looked at all these laws we've looked at the national laws we've looked at the international law we feel that this is a norm which is a peremptory norm which means that all states believe it's legal all states have it within their you know codified within their laws and therefore it is it is at a level that is even higher than a treaty so for example what does this mean it essentially means you can make the argument that okay there's a particular state that may not have signed the iccpr i mean to be honest most states have but assuming you haven't or assuming you've made a declaration or a reservation that this is something that you cannot um violate regardless of whether you've signed that treaty or not and that it is a norm a 
a norm of customary international law, which is at a higher level. So even if you've not signed the treaty, it is still going to be applicable to you. So it's a legal, you know, it's a legal tool. It's a legal hook to make that argument more effective. And I think, you know, the UN basic principles and guidelines give you that ability to make that legal argument as well. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, again, just to say that the UN basic principles are really important. They're about 19 or 20 principles and then guidelines based on the principles in terms of how you actually uh, implement and you know what actually these, these guidelines uh, principles mean. They also tackle the question of humanitarian law and IHRL being complementary. Also very clearly talk about extraterritorial scope. Clearly we're at a time where you know, we've had um, detentions or renditions, extra uh, renditions linked to the war on terror. So the working group wanted to make sure that that was included within the context of what it was speaking about. And of course, there's discussion on whether this needs a separate treaty or not. I mean, I, I'm not so sure on that. I think we've got a lot of the law and the jurisprudence already there. So again, something to keep in mind and something to, you know, to look at in the broader perspective. So I think I'll just conclude by saying, I, I can't emphasize enough how important this right is. And, you know, the, the requirement to safeguard this right, really at all costs. It is a bulwark against excess state power and authority and abuse. And so I think it's critical that this right, and at the end of the day, it is about individuals who are, you know, kept in, uh, who, who are either detained or arrested or really um, met with the full force of the state and there needs to be recourse and there needs to be relief and remedies for that. And there needs to be clear protection and guidelines on that. There are multiple legal avenues, but there are also many challenges, not the least of which is implementation of international law, domestic law. I mean, you've got a lot of cracks and, and gaps between that as well. But also to keep in mind that on the development of international law and on IHRL specifically, there are multiple strands and there's a lot of jurisprudence and there's a lot of case law out there. And many of these are interlinked and really are reinforcing. So I think it's, it's good to sort of keep that big picture in mind when we then look at specific circumstances or instances. So I think with that, I will stop. I've gone on for some time and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you Priya for that uh, wonderful presentation of not just the jurisprudence on uh, arbitrary detention, but also accountability and monitoring mechanisms. Uh, we are open to questions now. I think Pranav is first. You can also type your questions in chat for me to read out if uh, you don't want to appear in the recording. Pranav. You are on mute, Pranav. Thank you. Uh, hi, a very good evening from Bombay. My question is, do you think the working group on arbitrary detention needs to be given more teeth because I mean 32 opinions in a in, in the in, in, a, in a world that is ravaged by human rights violations is a little too less and a little too little and given the lack of engagement by a large number of states I mean while it's doing great work it's clearly not enough so what do you recommend should be done thank you so me just wondering should I address that or do you want to take more yes yes I mean, we, we generally go for questions one by one. Okay, okay. So no, I mean, Pranav, thank you for your question. I, I agree with you. I mean, yes, 32 opinions in, in a year are probably a drop in the ocean, especially as you say, you know, in the context of, of the human rights situation right now, pretty much world over. I think here's the, here's the thing, right? Um, on teeth for the working group. The working group has a mandate that emanates from the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council, as you know, is composed of states. And of course, has you know, regional rotation, has a fixed number of states. I think it's got a robust mandate and it does really good work as well. There are two points I would make. One is in terms of teeth, are you talking about enforcement? Are you talking about whether the working group can, for example, you know, demand access to a state. And that is always problematic. That has been problematic for the special rapporteurs of the UN. That's been problematic for, you know, most of these uh, treaty bodies as well. So I think that's a problem that 
is linked to the mandate, but is essentially linked to the fact that states are the ones that are creating that mandate and states are the ones that are in charge on the Human Rights Council. So I think that's a systemic structural problem for sure. And I agree with you. I mean, I would love for you know, a working group or, or a, a rapporteur to basically demand access and be able to enter into a state and you know, assess uh, the manner of detention, the way that detention is taking place. But unfortunately, that of course does, you know, does not happen based on very outdated arguments of sovereignty, which we've all heard and which of course are, are sort of repeated you know, uh, ad infinitum. But I think having said that, I think within the context of its mandate and what it has the power to do, I think it's actually doing a pretty stellar job in the sense that it's, um, it's got a few functions. One function is of course, immediate relief and being that voice that says, look, somebody is in detention, you need to get them out now. And therefore you've got this whole urgent appeals process, but it has another job as well. And, and I think this job is also, also really important. And that is to develop the law progressively and to develop and ensure that the law moves with the times as well, right? So for example, when you had uh, extrajudicial renditions and you've had these arbitrary detentions across borders, again, that was something that wasn't really talked about. And in the context of the war on terror, you know, since 2001, that's something that the group has realized, you know, we need to talk about this and we need to ensure that the law reflects this reality and that, you know, the, the ICCPR was written in 1979, drafted then, and it didn't, didn't necessarily keep that into account. So I think there are two components to the work, more as well in terms of investigation of these cases, ensuring that these opinions come out. I think the more cynical among us might say, look, what's the point of these opinions as well, right? I mean, you have somebody in detention, but I think it serves a huge purpose in terms of symbolic uh, signaling in terms of also saying, look, the international community is watching and these are violations of obligations you have taken, you have undertaken. And I think third, you know, that pressure does bring more focus and emphasis on particular cases and does hasten the process of release in some cases as well. And, you know, I, I think lastly, I would say development of international law, and that's critical to the entire scope of how Article 9 works beyond the individual cases. So, yeah, I think there's a lot more that could be done. And, you know, it, in an ideal world, I would like it to have much more teeth, of course. But I think for what it has to play with, I think it's, it's um, doing quite a good job, actually. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Priya. Uh, Gayatri. Well, um, Priya, I, I was wondering if you could also um, throw some light on um, the extraterritorial application of um, rights under the ICCPR and how this would play out in the detention context. Absolutely. Um, I think two things. One is the general comment sort of, um, you know, so the general comment of 2014, which is the Human Rights Committee has talked a little bit about it, not in a lot of detail. And I think this is where I find the working group on arbitrary detention has actually taken more strides and gone further. So they've essentially within the context of this 2014 report where they've talked about, you know, the um, ability to bring proceedings before a court. For them, they've made a few very clear statements and linked, linked to the law, linked to the fact that they've, they've looked at national law, international law, you know, regional treaties as well basically saying IHL and IHRL are complementary. You cannot make these artificial silos, which of course states have tried to do, right? They've said, well, you know, within the context of IHL or the war on terror, you know, however that is, is um, articulated, um, that, you know, some of these rules don't apply. Working group has said that's not the case. They actually do apply and IHRL, IHL are complementary, they will work together. And what is the basic underlying, uh, what's the raison d'etre of both, right? The, the ethos for humanitarian law, IHL, is protection. And within the context of IHL, 
that is paramount. It is a protection treaty as well. So I think the working group has made that point. And then it has very squarely in its, um, uh, the UN guiding principles, as well as in the 2014 report, said, look, we're going to tackle this question also of extraterritorial application. And detentions are detentions and they're arbitrary, no matter that it's across a border. And no matter that it's one state that has sort of, you know, rendered somebody across the border to another state, arbitrariness is still something that we will look at within that context. And that there is this extraterritorial application of this provision in, in this context as well. So I think they've taken it on sort of heads on as well. And I would really say, you know, take a look at the 2014 um, uh, report that was submitted to the Human Rights Commission, the annual report, as well as take a look at the UN uh, guiding principles, uh, principles and guidelines of 2015. It, it used the 2014 report to open the door to then work on these guide, you know, these uh, guiding principles as well. And I think they've addressed it quite squarely in that. Thank you. Uh, can we have Mui now? Um, I was uh, looking at the uh, Article 22 of the Indian Constitution. You know, you talked about the declaration that India made to ICCPR's Article 9. And, and I think what the government of India was trying to do there is, number one, um, um, obviously raise attention that they have preventive detention as part of their, as part of their codified law. And secondly, that um, the right doesn't apply to enemy aliens, uh, which I presume would be non-citizens of India. Um, I was wondering when in the eyes of international law, preventive detention becomes arbitrary detention. And um, how is this also viewed when it is done systematically in a particular place against a particular community over a course of time? Does it bubble up to crimes against humanity? Or does it stay at the level of arbitrary detention? Thank you. No, thanks for that question. I mean, I think very relevant and sort of on point. One is arbitrary detention is included within the context of war crimes and crimes against humanity, right? So if you look at the Rome Statute, Article 7, Article 8, do include within the list of these crimes, arbitrary detention is included within that context. So I think that's the first thing to remember that this is uh, seen as grave enough in many instances to be included within an international criminal law statute. So that's one. Of course, the problem is that, well, there are multiple problems. One is, of course, that India has not signed the Rome Statute. So then the question becomes, okay, are you looking at, and there's a discussion linked to this, which is, is there going to be a Crimes Against Humanity Treaty? So that's, you know, again, uh, uh, sort of, I, I digress. It's a little bit of a side question, but it's linked to this question of, okay, whether how it's conceptualized in international criminal law, not just international human rights law. So I think you've got a point there. Um, the other point I think that you made on the constitution and, and um, unlawful detention and indefinite detention. I mean, in my view, from what, Everything, you know, the, the Human Rights Committee has said from the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention as well. There, there's no question in my mind that preventive detention of the scale that is being done, you know, by India is definitely violative of Article 9. So, you know, and to your point, which is probably why, I mean, it's one of the few, I think, constitutions that explicitly does allow for this. And therefore, as you say, I mean, has that ICCPR declaration. The point, though, I think to, you know, and which is why I emphasized treaty law as well as customary international law right at the beginning of my um, presentation was that, okay, we're talking about this in the context of the ICCPR, but let's take a step back. The working group basically is talking about customary international law. It's saying, you know, yes, you've got treaty law, but you've also got something above and beyond that based on state practice based on what many other countries are doing based on you know our, our assessment of of the law across multiple jurisdictions so i think which is why for me the point of the working group developing law i mean that is partly also the point that we are then not limiting ourselves to the iccpr and an assessment within that context we're also saying look are some of these specific aspects 
peremptory norms? Are they customary international law? And the working group basically says yes, in, in especially linked to the ability to um, you know, bring proceedings before a court. Yes, this is something that goes beyond the treaty. So even if you've not signed or you have a declaration or you have a reservation, the argument that is building is on this specific aspect, at least the fact that you have a declaration or a treaty is insufficient. It's not going to be a helpful legal argument down the road. But that again then links to the process of development of international law and the function of some of these institutions in, in sort of um, developing it further. Thank you, um, Akshita. Hi Priya, so this is more of a general question. Um, given after 9-11, there were a lot of news about uh, the US government illegally and arbitrarily detaining a lot of transnationals and nationals from other countries in Guantanamo Bay. So were there any actions taken to the same effect by UN or the HRC? Uh, did anything happen? Was the US held accountable for the same in terms of international law? Oh, that is a very good question, a very loaded question. And to be honest, I could spend a few hours discussing that, but I'll, I'll sort of try to keep it a bit brief. Um, in short, consequences for that, no. Um, right now, you still have people who are detained and you still have Guantanamo that is open. So, you know, I think this is really an issue which is problematic at multiple levels, not just at the level of you've got people who are detain detained with no rule of law, no access to really, you know, judicial review. Keep in mind, Article 9 and, you know, again, this whole discussion on IHL, IHRL, the point is that these guarantees of protection need to be available regardless of whether it's armed conflict, regardless of whether it's a state of emergency. I mean, the fundamental rule is that there's that protection. So even within a military system, which is what Guantanamo purports to be, there needs still to be these fundamental guarantees. And I think, no, they have not been met. And, um, you know, I, I, I know of many lawyers who are right now still struggling to get their clients out of Guantanamo. And it's sort of, it's a real legal sort of black hole in a way. It's sort of in limbo where you've got, you know, people who are not quite going through any real uh, effective process if you're talking about length of time i mean it's excessive 2001 till now you're talking about you know effective legal remedies no they're they're, they're not allowed to you know leave and, and go where essentially some of them have been made stateless as well some of them are the result of a rendition so when you're talking also about conditions of detention you know that again links to the arbitrariness so for me it's a resounding <laughs> violation of article 9 but um but yeah, as of now, I think there's no real solution in sight. And I think that needs to be, that needs to come from within the US as well. And I think that was part of the discussion, which was, you know, that President Obama would shut down Guantanamo and expedite these proceedings. But um, that's, that's not happened yet. So I think we'll just have to see. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Mohammed Skanda. Uh, Dr. Pillai, I have a very quick question. Uh, what do you think uh, is the basic reason for India having reservation over victims' uh, enforceable right to compensation? Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, I think basically, you know, the the uh, declaration on that specifically is they don't want to open the the floodgates and don't want to consider that within the context of the legal system. I think. It's a few things. One is you've got this ability to detain within the context of, you know, Article 22. You also have a number of um, legislations which which do allow detention for a substantial amount of time. And I think keeping that in mind, keeping in, you know, and from the 70s, from the time of the ICCPR, even the question of internal conflicts, the ability to use some of these legislations as well. I mean, clearly for me, that would be part of the thinking or the rationale to say, if you give uh, an enforceable right of compensation, then you're going to have to deliver on that right. And you're going to have to actually allow people to, A, petition the courts for that compensation and then provide it. And clearly, I think, you know, the, the some of the thinking probably is that it would really open the floodgates and, and 
probably beyond the the scope of of what was considered sort of acceptable within the context of the ICCPR as well. So there's a question in chat by Yusuf, and uh, they ask what avenues are available under Article Nine for Tablighi Jamaat detained by Indian government in Delhi last year under the false accusation of being the source of COVID-19 and who was then set free by the courts. Some of the US and Canadian and other citizens have since returned home and most of these countries permit class action lawsuits. Is there a provision for a lawsuit against Indian government for illegal detention as a part of compensation mechanism for the victims? That's a really interesting question. I mean, I haven't really thought it through off the bat. I mean, I think if you're talking about foreign nationals who have now returned to, the, to their countries, I mean, I, I guess the, the legal sort of hook or the way that you would have, a, okay, just to clarify, I think one would be if you're talking about an interstate dispute. So for example, you know, if they're Canadian nationals who basically lobby the Canadian government to say, either we're gonna ask, you know, we're gonna put diplomatic pressure on India or we're gonna ask for compensation or are we looking at an interstate dispute? If that is the, the, you know, if that's part of the question, then for that, you need a particular legal hook. So for example, um, you know, you need either a treaty that allows you to make that claim. And I think, again, I, I need to cross check, but I'm pretty sure that for the ICCPR, India has a reservation on what is called compulsory jurisdiction, which basically means that you know, you're not going to automatically allow an international court of justice proceeding based on violations or based on uh, an interpretation or a dispute around the ICCPR. So for example, um, recently Canada and the Netherlands, the Netherlands actually opened the floodgates on this. They inst they've instituted what are proceedings that could lead to a court case at the International Court of Justice. So under the Convention on the Prohibition of Torture, Article 30 is a dispute provision, which basically says if one state has a dispute with another state on the interpretation or the application or the violation of a particular treaty, in this case, the prohibition on torture, we can initiate a dispute provision, which we can basically ask that state, you know, let's negotiate or let's arbitrate. And if within two years that doesn't happen, that will result in a, a case before the International Court of Justice. So the Netherlands has done this against Syria and Canada has now kicked off the same uh, proceeding as well against Syria. I use this example to say that they had that legal provision in Article 30 of the Convention Against Torture, which allowed them to go down this route. Now, there's no separate treaty on arbitrary detention. So we don't have that provision there. The ICCPR, uh, you know, and, and I'm pretty sure that there's a reservation linked to the automatic sort of um, jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. So I think on that, there might be fewer ways to um, initiate legal proceedings. And I'm guessing it would probably be more linked to, you know, diplomatic uh, diplomatic pressure or yeah talks uh, along these along these lines basically thanks Priya. i know we have to make a hard stop at two you have uh, another commitment right after this there's one question by shub in in chat uh, uh, she asked thank you for your presentation and for making the point that indian violations of article 9 among many other provisions amount to crimes against humanity is the ICJ a possible tribunal for criminal prosecutions for Indian crimes against humanity in Kashmir? Do these have to meet the definition of genocide? In your opinion, do these abuses amount to the crime of genocide? Okay, I think, I mean, I'll take a look at the question in more detail, but just based on, I think what you're saying, Samir, one is, let's, let's keep in mind a few things, right? One is, the ICJ is an interstate dispute mechanism, right? Whereas you've got international criminal law, you've got the international tribunals, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, which is the international criminal law sort of um, approach, for example. Now, there are a few problems. One is the ICC is 
generally linked to state parties, those that have signed the Rome Statute, with many of the big countries have not, including, you know, Russia, the US, Pakistan, India, China, you know, we've got the big countries that haven't signed on. However, the one point that I would make is that even within the context of the ICC, for example, if you look at Myanmar, Bangladesh right now, you know, what happened in 2017, proceedings have been initiated at the ICC by virtue of the fact that Bangladesh is a state party, not Myanmar, but proceedings are being initiated in regard to Myanmar itself. So, you know, keep in mind that there are different legal uh, approaches and angles, and this question on jurisdiction is something that is getting opened up also when you look at the recent decision at the ICC um, about Palestine. So you've got other jurisdictional um, ways of getting around the fact that a state may not have signed a particular treaty. So that's one thing I would say. The other I would say is um, the ICJ, I mean, if you're looking, it's not a prosecution. The ICJ is a state interstate dispute mechanism. So even, you know, the, the case that I, uh, sort of I, 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 I've been involved in linked to the Gambia versus Myanmar, it's very clear. The aim is not prosecutions at that point. The, the aim is state responsibility to ensure that a state is held responsible and whatever that entails. That might mean compensation, restitution, you know, there, there are multiple other um, legal consequences that ensue. So I would just say that there are these different spheres that you need to look at and that there are different legal approaches and avenues within each of these. And let's not confuse them. I think it, it muddies the waters to really confuse them too much. And then you're not really clear on, okay, what is it that you're seeking to achieve as well at the end using that legal avenue? Thank you. There are a few more questions, but unfortunately we will not be able to take them here. We have blocked them for the seminar later this week on Saturday. Uh, 20th March from 12.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. GMT or 6 to 8 p.m. IST. Uh, thanks a lot, Priya, for this wonderful lecture and for, for answering questions so well. Um, it, it, was a, it was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. I mean, I would have stayed a bit longer, but I do have to run. But, um, you know, I, I look forward to hearing how the rest of the seminar and everything went and, and you know, wishing you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll see the rest of you on Saturday. Bye-bye.